So thanks for the presentation. Uh, my name is Manuel. I'm a PhD candidate based in Oslo, working at the Intervention Center. And I'm going to talk about the improved control of cardiac pacemakers in heart failure. Uh, first off, I want to broadly go over the cardiac conduction system, as it will serve as a background for my project. So in a healthy heart, as the one we have here, the electrical stimuli is released by the sinusoidal node at a regular rate dictated by the needs of the body. And then this uh, stimuli will then travel through the myocardium, contracting the atrium until it reaches the atrioventricular node, and then quickly propagates to the right and left ventricular myocardium via the bundle branches. The image on the right shows an example of uh, what a normal ECG will look like, and the four signals underneath are uh, electromyograms of uh, four different walls of the left ventricle. This is just to see, to observe how the QRS is quite narrow in the ECG, and that uh, here all the uh, walls are activated at the same time, as we can see by the spikes being quite simultaneous. Uh, now, in our study, we focus on cardiac desynchrony. In particular, we study left bundle branch broke, or LBBB, which is a cardiac conduction abnormality. In this case, the uh, electrical stimuli cannot propagate through the left branch, so it will have a slower propagation, causing a delayed activation of the left ventricle lateral wall compared to the septum, because uh, uh, they're now stimulated at different times. This causes a reduction in systolic function and will also induce uh, multiple changes to the organ in patients. Uh, now on the right, we see again the ECG that it has changed. Now the QRS is quite wide. And also the electromyograms are not simultaneous anymore. And we have the septal one coming first and the lateral one coming last. To treat the dysfunction, uh, we have a cardiac resynchronization therapy or CRT which is a medical device that uh, basically consists in a pacemaker with three leads that aims to restore synchronicity and therefore improve cardiac function in uh, heart failure patients with LBBB. However, uh, the, patient the patient response to this uh, treatment varies strongly and approximately 30% of them don't benefit from it, which, uh, with some of them even worsening. Uh, there is no consensus uh, right now uh, on which hemodynamic or electric parameter to use for a prediction of a long-term response, and there's no uh, good way to differentiate between a respondent or non-respondent patient before the implantation of the device. With this in mind, the goals of, of our study are to try to find a new index that will show acute response to pacing. And for this purpose, we use motion sensors with uh, the hope of finding a reliable index that will give real-time feedback to clinicians during implantation. This will allow them to determine if a responder, uh, if a patient is a responder, and potentially help them to identify the optimal, the optimal placement of uh, the pacing group. The main issue that uh, we had uh, when we started was cost, cost changes in preload during interventions. Uh, here we define preload as the distending force of the left ventricle at the end of diastole, uh, which is proportional to the volume at this point. And we saw that pacing uh, reduced the left ventricular volume acutely. And this reduction will then in turn attenuate or abolish uh, any expected improvement in conventional contractility indexes, such as ejection fraction, stroke volume, stroke work, and uh, DPDT max. This meant uh, that uh, these indexes were inaccurate uh, measures to see if, uh, if there was a good response to pacing. Uh, and their values basically remained unchanged uh, during pacing, despite uh, having a higher ventricle efficiency. In order to tackle this, the first study that we've done is uh, analyzing the index time to, DP time to peak LV DPDT, or TD in search of a preload independent index. This measures the time from onset of electrical activation to the peak of left ventricular pressure rise. It was pre previously described briefly as a load independent measurement of contractility that incorporates features of both QRS duration and uh, DPDT max. But we saw potential in it and argued that it could be also linked, uh, it could be the link between electrical activation and mechanical function in CRT 
and that uh, shortening of this value uh, when pacing will reflect the shortening time of activation rather than a change of in contractility. So to study this, we use an experimental model with uh, 12 animals where LBBB was induced reablation. Here you can see a schematic of a left ventricle that shows how our model is designed. Uh, the black dots here represent ultra ultrasound crystals that are placed in the myocardium and measure the distance between themselves. And this allows us to estimate the left ventricular volume using a three-axis ellipsoid model from, uh, from these three pairs. This would be the two short axis and from two to one will be the long axis. Also, the crystals at the equatorial level, this four here, uh, placing the septum, posterior, anterior, and lateral walls have uh, electrodes that record the electromyograms, as uh, I showed earlier. And this combination of crystals and electrodes uh, will allow us to evaluate both the myocardial electrical and mechanical activation. Uh, in addition to that, we also place several pacing electrodes to study different pacing configurations. So we place one in the right atrium, that will be here, two in the RV, one in the free wall, and one placed in the septal apical position. And then we have three pacing leads in the LV, apical, anterior, and lateral areas. Lastly, we attach an accelerometer on the LV lateral wall that is used for uh, several of our studies and is the motion sensor that we're like studying right now. It's here. Going back to TD, uh, this graph shows an example of how this index is measured. Uh, the dashed lines here mark the onset of the electrical activation, while this one measures the PDT max down here. So basically, this time interval between two dashed lines is the measurement that we're, that we're doing. This is TD. In the left side here, we have a case with a right ventricular free wall pacing that creates a big desynchrony. As you can see from the activation activation sequence of the electromyograms, with an early septal activation and a late lateral activation. Also, there's quite a lot of deformation in the LV uh, due to the impaired contraction, as you can see here from the septum lateral segments and anterior posterior. On the other hand, the right panel shows the same animal with a ventricular pacing, a ventricular pacing. And now the activation sequence is uh, early in the lateral wall because we're pacing from that exactly that point. But we have very little deformation and uh, meaning that the rise of pressure is reads faster and this translates to a smaller value of TD, as we can see here. As I mentioned before, the preload dependency is an issue with some of the traditional parameters used to evaluate CRT response. And these graphs show the recordings where the volume was reduced through the volume of the eleven ventricle was reduced through cable constrictions, allowing us to evaluate the dependency of each index under study. The orange lines in each four uh, represents TD, and we can see that it remains almost constant throughout all changes in, in diastolic volume, which is the x-axis. On the other hand, uh, stroke work, stroke volume, ejection fraction, and the PDT max have a clear variation if we like if we decrease the diastolic volume. This shows that TD is uh, quite preload independent and allows us to use it without worrying about this. This table shows the results from uh, the interventions in the animal study. So here we can see that the value of TD under normal conduction uh, with atrial pacing is quite low. As expected, the, the value increases uh, once uh, ablation in, is done and we have LBBB as marked in red, and uh, the, the delay is partially restored during biventricular pacing. There's actually a shortening of TD in this configuration compared to all, all others, like LBBB, right ventricular pacing, and left ventricular pacing. And we observe also that the, these values of TDs are, association, are associated with less deformation and narrow QRS complex, measured here with the QRS duration. In addition to the animal experiment, a clinical study was done uh, with 26 heart failure patients uh, that were admitted for CRT implantation according to current guidelines with the inclusion criteria of sinus rhythm, functional classes, two and three of heart failure, LBVB, QRS duration larger than 130 milliseconds, and an ejection fraction lower than 
all patients have the RV lead played, placed in the apical portion of the right ventricle, but to test different lead placements, the left ventricle lead was placed in an anterior position for 13 patients and in an apical position for another 13 before the permanent position in the lateral vein. So each position uh, uh, was each patient was placed from uh, the atrium, the right ventricle, left ventricle, and biventricular, biventricular, with a heart rate that was set at 10% above the intrinsic rate and an AV delay set to avoid fusion with intrinsic conduction. The results of these trials are shown in this panel that displays the effect of the interaction between pacing mode and electron position on the PDT max in the top panel and TD in the bottom panel. We found that the PDT max increased with both LV pace and biventricular pacing in a similar way, being hard to differentiate between them, while TD, on the other hand, decreased significantly with biventricular pacing, as we see here, especially when paced from the lateral wall, which is supposed to be the optimal position compared to all other pacing modes. This shows that TD is actually a better at showing your synchronization than the PDT max, which is a, a standard measure. So the results of uh, these studies showed that the index uh, TD actually reflects the myocardial deformation resulting from the synchrony and resynchronization as lower values are associated with lower deformation, narrow QRS complex, and a typically, typically optimal electroposition. It also outperforms the classical marker of myocardial function, so that's the PDT max, and it therefore seems to be an ideal marker for mechanical anomalies that may be corrected by CRT. Finally, I would just like to mention an ongoing study that uh, we're doing based on accelerometers. Uh, so after finding an index that showed a good acute response to pacing, we tried uh, to find a similar index derived from a motion sensor that could reflect cardiac function. The images on the right show the sensor that was initially used in our experiments and the placements on the heart. And then here we can see uh, some signals, that, the signals that we get from it. Uh, here in a baseline recording and here in a uh, after LBVB, after the ablation and uh, we have an LBV model. Uh, we're now discussing if any of this is patentable, so I will not go into details here, but I'll just say that uh, although the results of this study are just preliminary, we have seen that the index derived from the accelerometer correlates quite well with the cardiac function as seen here, which uh, is each color is a different animal under study. And that is not, a, as, not as expected as other traditional indexes by preload, as we can see in this graph, where it only increases 20% more or less uh, compared to this change of 80% in other indexes. So thank you very much. Excellent. Some intriguing results there uh, and some uh, really encouraging one. Thanks. Audience, time to engage. Questions from Manuel. Carlos. Oh, hi, uh, Manuel. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I I was uh, when you showed the model that you that you built and you uh, put the spots where you that you chose for a, a spacing site. Why did you choose some of them, like the anterior wall of the left ventricle or the um, or the free wall or the right ventricle? Because I know in clinical practice they are not so much used. Why did you choose that? Uh, yes, uh, we actually tried different configurations. Uh, so this is the latest one we chose, and it was uh, we talked with some cardiologists, and they wanted to see if the distance from the apex uh, actually mattered. Uh, and so it was just to study that, that methodology. But uh, yeah, mainly we were studying the apical position and the lateral wall and the anterior is a bit, yeah. But yeah, we've tried the different configurations. Okay, thanks. Great, more questions, audience? Okie dokie. 
Sally, go for it. No. Hi. Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation, Manuel. Um, I'm not sure I um, grasped this off your slides, though, but you did show um, like the uh, sort of results you got for like dyssynchrony um, and the likes, like in the heart. Uh, I'm just not exactly sure how you hope to then take these results and translate it into actually improving um, the pacemakers. Uh, basically, at first we were looking for a gold standard and the yeah. idea is now to use uh, uh, sensors like the accelerometer could say that can be quite small and can be actually integrated to pacing leads. So while, okay. uh, while placing the device, they can give a uh, real-time measurement. That's the main idea. Okay, thank you. 